The fact that the final recording is about rooms being sealed in a game about Springtrap who was sealed in a room, with the recordings being found in the FNAF 1 location along with the Funky Rabbit Man, leads me to believe that these tape- I just like the idea of William Afton as the Funky Rabbit Man, honestly. Just the idea of Funky Rabbit Man, just like busting out like, Whoa! That bar- <laughs> Doing his little spring lock dance. Hey guys, and welcome to GT Not Live, where today Ash is back and Sam is in the seat. We got everyone. Woo! How many mental entities does it take for me to have the right light? <laughs> Ash is adjusting the light. This is, last time was the time that I was talking about the lighting, right? And I was like ranting about the umbrella light and how everyone wants the umbrella light and this and that, right, Sam? Yep, that was last time. So Ash is here now. You're back from whatever you were doing. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not near my. You're not near my. Just you can either shout really loudly or you can just find the nearest mic. I was fighting demons. Oh, what sort of demons? Um, mental and personal. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> A fight that we can all relate to. I was hoping you would say like, oh, Satan incarnate, or like, suck you by, so whooping down. No, you know, <laughs> crippling anxiety. Well, how do you know that's not the form that they take? <laughs> I mean, that's true. Maybe, maybe. You're not in my head. I'm in yours, though. That is true. What, uh, so, yeah, what, what form do your personal demons take? Um, you know, I could describe it, but I'm worried that the mere description of these Speaking will the frighten you to your core and could possibly summon them. Wow, okay, that's fair. It's not the space for that's it. That's fair. So in the meantime, you're just going to roam around and adjust the lighting? Yes, sometimes light is what you need to face the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> the darkness on this side of my face. So if we could just like balance that out, that would be great. Uh, I'm trying. No, no <laughs> last time, just because Ash didn't see the last episode. Uh, last time I, I was talking about how like, ah, oh, whatever, we're doing it because if it doesn't look great, that's fine. It's a YouTube video. So I appreciate your attention to detail. Wow. Oh my gosh. I just stared directly into it. It just, <laughs> oh, it's, I'm so blind now. You've seen the light. I have. I've seen the light. I'm not going to see anything that we're reacting to today. Um, how was everyone's weekend? Everyone have a good weekend? Very exciting weekend. Oh, wow, Sam. Very exciting. What'd you do this weekend? I made it all the way to season 14 of Grey's Anatomy. How old are you? 25. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Way to, way to carpe that DM. Way to carpe that DM. Way to seize that day. I'm glad that youth is not squandered on you. Thank you. <laughs> How many seasons did you binge through? Uh, just in the weekend. Just in the weekend? Yeah, just in the weekend. <laughs> just, I'm just real curious about how much of the 48-hour period of the weekend was dedicated to watching the, the exploits of McDreamy and McSteamy. Uh, honestly, maybe a season and a half. It's and, like and half and a half. And, no, it's a se season and a half. Uh, and, and we're talking about, like, mainstream uh media television series like this isn't like oh yeah modern day cable entertainment series where it's like eight episodes and you're done no, no like this is 24 episodes a season 48 minutes <laughs> yeah this is see. an abc studios production <laughs> i mean yeah those those lasted forever man uh-huh uh and every episode is basically the same right yeah, someone gets sick and they save them. Yeah, great. Or they don't. It's very save satisfying. Them. Or they don't. That's it. Cool. Life and death, whatever. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's really about who's kissing who in the OR. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, speaking of lore, we have more lore to talk. Yeah, the lore of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Because that's a lore that that we're really excited about. Um, speaking of the lore of Grey's Anatomy, uh, we're going to talk more about the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's here uh, with our friend... Oh, you transitioned to it full screen. I did. You just want me off screen at this point. <laughs> You're just did. punishing me. Uh, He's gone. <laughs> He's like, you made fun of, you made fun of Grey's Anatomy. Uh, that is ABC primetime programming on, right there. I'm on the way. Ash is on the way. <laughs> yeah. picture, picture. You can't perceive her either because she ran... There you go. We got... Yep. Hey! Go. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> well done. Too easy. Uh, so anyway, today we're continuing our adventures through Id's fantasy uh, video where she solves my sister location problem. Last time Is I- Is it Id or Id? I thought it was Id. I mean, 
Is it? IDs? Ids? It, it could be either. It might be. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if it was ID. I've never seen one of her videos where she introduces herself by name. It's true. See? So, like, what, am I what am I supposed to do? Maybe she ID'd herself. I mean, she literally <laughs> yeah. did. That, yeah. that literally, it's right there. I mean, it is name. right there, but like in like an like an auditory sense. Maybe I, I, I have not heard if if she has indeed ID'd herself. <laughs> I have not heard that ID. Ah, uh, okay. You know, I've 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 tuned into. One Would you two. say it's a fantasy? Oh my god! Her ID I, is I, a fantasy. Woo! Woo! See, I like him. <laughs> I like him. <laughs> and how many three seasons months. of Grey's Anatomy did you watch this weekend, then, Ash? <laughs> How many seasons of Grey's Anatomy was collectively consumed in the studio? Because I'll tell you my count, zero. I taught my four-year-old how to play charades, and it did not go well. Oh, really? It was fine. Yeah. He, he, he wandered around on all fours, and I thought he was pretending to be Beast Bendy from, like, the, the final boss of Bendy Link Machine. Mm. But, oh, no, he was an Antilochilosaur, or some obs very obscure dinosaur that he was like dunking on me for, for not uh, being able to identify based on this. I'm like, are, are you Bendy? And like, no, are you, you know, are you a deer, a buffalo, a dinosaur? He's like, no, I'm an entire guy, but I, it wasn't, it, it's not, here's the thing. It was not a dinosaur that you've ever heard of. It's a, an obscure entity that he learned through his uh, adventures globe, the uh, prehistoric uh, creatures downloadable pack. So <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah, obviously it's the like the transitionary point between uh, reptiles and, and mammals that lived in this part of the world. And I'm like, OK, great. The, uh, how could I have not gotten that? What a fool I've been S staring at me in the space. We're okay. oh, Man, we're ID's fantasy. We're going to uh, id's fantasy. We're, we're getting there. Maybe she is the embodiment of the id. You know, the oh. ego, the super ego. But she's the id. She's the chaotic. She's the like, I'm all about the the lust for life. I'm going out there having my... I love that my eye line is just shifting with you as you move around. I, I swear I'm talking to someone. My eye line is like sprinkler time right here. Uh, so I just keep moving. I've grown more powerful. You are. You, you've been I've left the constraints of the corner. <laughs> my time is now. Oh, no. Season it. Uh, last thing before we hop into more FNAF talk, uh, because that's what we need more of is just all the FNAF talk, um, is the fact that uh thing about charades a lot of the like signature charades gestures don't translate to people the youth of the nation like historically right like if you think about like how do you indicate movies it's like this right but like what is this anymore it's like i'm turning the crank of the whatever it's like i'm cranking open a spring lock suit or something like this isn't a, a movie anymore no one does this you want to start a film there it is done <laughs> Boop! Ah, uh, <laughs> changing a channel on the TV. Not even that though. You know, like uh, one of the things uh, that I tried to gesture to him was like time flies. And so flying, that's easy. You know, bee versus bird or whatever. But time, like historically, right? Like the universal indicator for time is like, oh, let me check my watch. Time. But no one actually wears watches or checks their time on their watch anymore. Like you're checking your phone. You're shouting to Google, there's like a clock on the wall, like it's digital. The idea of like an analog watch on your on your wrist is like so forth. If anything, this is like a step counter, which is crazy. Like, what would you do? Like, at this point, what is it? Like, time? Is this time at this point? Like, are you uh, the, the actual clock itself? How would you indicate time? Invisible people. M my mind time. went to stopwatch immediately. Like that? Yeah, I guess. Or like tapping your wrist. Like you're looking at a watch, because Apple watches are a thing. Apple watches are a thing, but are you, you are are they synonymous with time at this point, or is it like boop? I got a notification. Because really, it's like check the time, watch a video, <laughs> change the lights in my room. Sometimes, like whatever, it's all it's all done this on this thing, which is crazy. Or you could like really over dramatically like hold up your wrist like Ugh, and like check the time. But again, like this doesn't <laughs> but this doesn't mean anything if. Like, you don't associate time with your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. With a watch. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Like, I don't wear a watch to tell... Like, I don't wear watches at all anymore. I mean, I don't I don't wear watches, but I still, like... I don't know, maybe it's just a sign that I'm aging. You also know the Beatles, though. 
<laughs> Hello? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is one of them. See, you know the Beatles. Like I said. <laughs> There it is. You think time is on your wrist, but you also know the Beatles. So those (laughs) things make complete sense. I'm I'm saying, like, when we got a, when YouTube sent us a record, YouTube sent us a record player. (laughs) Other story. When YouTube sent us a record player as our, like, yearly, like, hey, thanks for being a part of this thing gift, you're like, record player! As opposed to, I think, a lot of people who'd be like, machine (laughs) of some sort. What is this physical media? I don't understand. Like, you got it, right? Yeah. It's like the classic, like, kids react to analog media. This episode, turntables. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I don't know. I'd, I'd be curious. Let me know down in the comments below. How would you indicate time at this point? Do you know? Like, do you know this? If I did, whoa, let me check my time. <laughs> I'm late like, for an important date. It was hard. Uh, so anyway, uh, last time we were uh, breaking down ID or ID's. Now we went through a whole episode calling it Id's Fantasy, and now I'm like sick. It's like the time I did OWO the entire time. Oh, whoa! You went o- OWO instead of OWO? Did you, do you not watch our channels, oh, Ash? No, when was that? Uh, it was, I don't know, it was a year ago? I guess it was maybe slightly before. It was around the time you have just been starting, or maybe slightly before. So, yeah, okay, that's my impact, okay. y'all. You're welcome. <laughs> what, we that healed I know how it. To say oh now. Yeah. No, that was the editors like raking me over the coals, being like, "What are you? How did you not know that?" Ooh, which one? All of that. It was really a collective group <laughs> effort to shame me for that one. Let's be honest. Oh, it was I'm... just like all hands on deck to shame Matt Pat. Uh, I'm oh. so proud of y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, ids or id fantasy. Uh, we're continuing this one. Uh, I've openly admitted that the sister location placement is one of those things that I've struggled with in my timeline. Um, and I think that there was in general, one of the things we talked about was there's a general, uh, misunderstanding about like kind of what I was referring to about when Michael goes back and revisited, revisits the defunct pizzerias, how I think he might have been revisiting pizzerias that were already closed, but just old buildings that still had Fazbear stuff in them and needed like a skeleton crew of people to check in on it every once in a while, make sure vandals aren't there. Um, and then he sets those on fire, right? So that's how I'm, in my own head, able to justify it happening in 1993. The biggest question mark there is obviously the paychecks, um, where I'm like, you know, hey, if he truly is Fritz Smith, if he is this guy who's being fired for tampering with the animatronics and odor, why would a paycheck be, say, 1987 at that point? That is the one key issue in my timeline that really doesn't make sense, and it's a detail that I had to like be like, eh, I can't really solve this one. But also, I feel like in this story where all these pieces and parts don't quite cleanly fit together, that's a minor piece relative to kind of telling an, an overall compelling story at this point um, with, with motivations and, and things like that. Uh, we had some good revelations along the way as we were taking, uh, taking apart the arguments in uh, her episode last time. But uh, today we actually get to the solution, which I'm very excited about because I don't know and I'm very excited to have someone solve it for me. So let's begin, shall we? So if Molten MCI doesn't actually impact Sister Location's timeline placement, what does? There are a few things that we can use to figure this out. First, the time frame that the Funtime animatronics and Circus Baby's Pizza World Pizza World were made. Second, just want, need to upgrade the pizza. I'm like, oh no, we're, th- we're launching into random ad unit. No, nope. just want to up that resolution. Great, awesome. When William was springlocked. And third, the reasons for Michael and William's activity at the various Fazbear locations they go to. The creation of the Fun Times and Circus Babies locations have a lot of moving pieces, but fortunately, we're told enough that we can get at least a general idea. Okay. In the first night of Sister Location, Hand Unit says, Due to the massive success, and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender at children's entertainment. Unlike most entertainment venues, our robotic entertainers are rented out for private parties during the day. There are two things we learned from this. First, that Circus Babies was built after one of the three closings of Freddy's, and second, that- Yes, one of the three closings of Freddy's. So you're saying- I like I like that she tosses in, oh, just, you know, the, just the three times that it closed. So what would be the three t- closings of Freddy's? FNAF 1, original location. FNAF 2, 87 location. Maybe 93? Or are we talking about Fred Bear's Family Diner? Because that would also count as a closure. And and also, when you're talking about the closure of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it, it, that line is always tricky to me. Because it's like, are you talking about an individual 
Restaurants? I don't think so. I think you're talking about the franchise as a whole, right? The like it's that's the difference of like, hey, an individual Chuck E. Cheese closed versus the entire franchise of Chuck E. Cheese closed. And I think in this case, when you say the unfortunate closure of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, you gotta think about it as the whole franchise of Freddy Fazbear's has basically become defunct at that point. It's it's basically primed for a defunct land video. Um let me tell you the story about like all the murders and death that happened here. Um why would I say that? Because they say, hey, the stage is now set for a new brand or a new style of animatronic entertainment, right? So saying only one location closed isn't enough, right? Freddy Fazbear's might exist elsewhere. And so, you know, for a new franchise with a new concept to step in, I that's the way I interpret that as like, hey, Freddy Fazbear's as a corporate entity is really closed which again is why I put sister location towards the end or kind of like in that middle period before the reopening of the entire franchise in FNAF 6, right? Because there does seem to be this, this gap in time between Fazbear Frights, right? Fa Fazbear Frights is like, hey, remember that thing that we all were creeped out by as kids, and, you know, back when we, were, when we were growing up? Yeah, let's let's have a nostalgic party around that. Fazbear Frights happens, then Henry's like, hey, people are nostalgic about this. Let me bring back the franchise in a big way to lure all the animatronics back and finish them off one last time. So to, to me, that line right there says it is happening in the gap between the closure of the entire franchise. There's no more Freddy Fazbear's. There's no more pizzerias that are going to roll out down the line. It has to be the last closure of the building. And then you go to the next time you hear about the Freddy Fazbear's franchise is in uh, Fazbear Frights, like as this kind of like nostalgic throwback. That's how I interpret it at. But I have seen a lot of people, and it seems like she's interpreting it the same way, where it's like individual restaurants closing, which I think is also valid, but I think it's harder to justify because you're talking about like a big franchise shakeups. But the specific Circus Babies location being referred to is most likely the rental location, as that's what Hand Unit describes rather than Circus Babies Pizza World. Uh, the one thing I will say, and, and I will... I think this is just kind of like a corollary point to, to what I just said. I think that there's a case to be made that 1987, oh, let me think if I'm, I'm going to say this right. I, is, is this true? No, it's probably not true. Uh, but, but maybe, I think that there's a chance that you could, you could make a case for the franchise itself closing roughly by the end of 1987. Because that is your, it's already closed once. That's your re grand reopening location, which then has another tragedy happen to it. Five more kids die. And then it closes for good? No, because then there's a third... You know that there's a third iteration of it that reopens again. I mean, maybe it opens later that year. <sighs> again, like, for the franchise itself to close down by 1987, that's it's a really tight timeline. And, and, that's, and the reason I say that is it, that's throwing away, like, I mentioned this before in the previous episode, where... I feel like I'm the one that con contributed in 1993 as like the big date in this franchise that everyone's like, no, but then FNAF is open in 1993 because of the paycheck, because of the paycheck. Sorry about that. But if we ignore that, if we just kind of like throw that away, is there a case to be made that everything closes by 1987? It's tough. You would have to have a really tight timeline for that to work. Anyway. Which makes sense given Circus Baby's Pizza World unceremoniously closed on opening day due to <clears throat> gas leaks. There are three notable points in the series that <clears throat> Freddy's location has closed, excluding of course Pizzeria Simulator, which would have to be after Sister Location given the fact that the Sister Location animatronics are present. Once after the missing children's incident in 1985, again after FNAF 2's 1987 yeah. location went downhill, and again after the 1993 FNAF 1 location shut down 30 years before FNAF 3. Sorry, my contribution. I, th I think it's locked into lore at this point, but I think that threw off a lot of things. This gives us three possible points for the placement of Sister Location, in between the MCI and FNAF 2, between FNAF 2 and FNAF 1, and after FNAF 1. Depending yes. on how back the fun times were made, that could push the events of Sister Location further up the timeline. However, with the time they seem to have been made, I don't think that would actually change things. Despite the fact that the fun times appear relatively high-tech, that doesn't actually mean they were made closer to the present day. In yeah, fact, that's, and again, like, this is, I mentioned this last time, but that's one of those things that people have change their minds about, right? When when Sister Location first launched, it had to be last in the timeline. Lore evidence notwithstanding, it had to be last in the timeline because everyone's like, oh, these are the most advanced robots, most advanced animatronics. I think that's a, a decent point to be made, but I think at this point, the actual aesthetics and design and technology that houses these things 
is less important. I think we've all kind of lessened the importance of that as a specific important point to the lore. Amongst the unreleased data for FNAF AR, there's a list of faz facts, one of which says some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured claw mechanisms that were able to hide away items inside them. And again, it's a, a good point. That is a great evidence point. Some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured claw mechanisms that were able to hide. That's pretty big. And again, you get to that point of like, well, when does cut lines count? Does it count? Can you use that to help support your the Like to me, and I, th I think this is my policy at this point, is cut lines are useful to give you an idea of a mindset of the creator. And they're not like, I wouldn't see this and be like, oh, this proves everything. But this, I see this line and I'm like, oh, this tells me the mindset of the people who are telling this story. Let me see what other evidence points I can pull in to help support my narrative or help support my case at that point. Because it was cut, right? And this, and again, it's we went through this entire drama with Security Breach where it was like, Gregory, you're bleeding, you know? And, and uh, no, no, it was, uh, you're broken. I will put you back together. Like the, the cut lines in there, right? Really strongly alluded to, hey, you're rebuilt. Maybe this is a reference crime child, whatever. And so is that in and of itself proof? No, but it does help support a line of thinking that you can then go to. Um, I actually have never seen this. Uh, this is really interesting to me. And this is, in, this is cut lines from FNAF AR specifically? Amongst the unreleased data for FNAF AR, there's a huh. list of faz facts. One of- I thought, it, what other ones are in here? I'm curious. The famous William Afton is the man responsible for the creation of the animatronics we all know and love. That's interesting too. Famous William Afton is the man responsible for the creation of the animatronics we all know and love. So is it like, cause he, yes, kind of, but also no, like him and Henry, definitely Henry, despite the name, hurricanes are actually not the leading cause of death in children in Hurricane Utah. So again, we have the reinforcement of Hurricane Utah being the important place. Fazbear's Twisted Pizza recipe was voted most yummy by six out of 10 children in every survey from 88 to 93. So again, that shows, huh? So again, these cut lines, which I've never seen, I'm surprised that I never came across these in my research. I've seen all the cut lines from Security Breach. I, AR, AR is, I will admit, is like kind of a big blind spot for me. I know the main emails that, was, that were released. I know the skins, I know the gameplay. Like I know a lot of the main stuff around it. I never, I never come across the cut lines from AR. I think it's crazy that in every single survey between the years of 1988 and 1993, there was a question that said like, hey kids, What's your favorite pizza recipe? Every single one. Well, crucial distinction, Ash. See, this is where survey design will get to you. It's not what's your favorite, it's most yummy. Oh, yes. So you can skew the results that way. You know, might not be the best recipe. It might be the most yummy though. Most yummy. Do you think it had all of the slashes and the little asterisks yeah, around it absolutely too? Absolutely did. Yeah. Huh, absolutely needed, needed all the slashes. That's the, that's the trademark name of it. Excellent. Six out of 10 show, that's 60%. Who, who was the other four? Pizza Hut? Most yummy? Pizza? <laughs> um, Papa John's? Papa John's is- yeah, It wasn't Papa John's. I don't know, is Chuck E. Cheese canon in this universe? Ooh, it'd, be, it'd be pretty spunky. Competitor. It'd be spunky if the other four children said Chuck E. Cheese. No. <laughs> Rivals. <That's amazing. laughs> but it's, it's really interesting, 1988 to 1993, so it says that like for that period of what, two, five years? that, you know, Fazbear's seems to have existed in that period. Interesting. I'm, I'm shocked by these revelations. You're still hunched over the microphone, so I'm assuming you're going to say something. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just reading very intently. Oh, okay, cool. I'm, like, squinting a little bit. No, no, you're fine. Squint, yeah. Squint away. Cool. One of which says some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured That's claw weird. mechanisms that were able to hide That's away weird. items inside them. I, that, I don't know. Okay, so my interpretation of that, I mean, obviously it's, it's trying to indicate, like, hey, early on, but also, are they the? They're the first ones that are classified under like Afton Robotics. Did he build other things before that? Maybe not. I've, I, we've done a big part about the distinction between Henry Robots versus Afton Robots. It would be weird for him. Yeah, 
I mean, I could see it. That's interesting. How about you? But this sounds very reminiscent of what we see Circus Baby do to Elizabeth I mean, yeah, in the Child yes. Cavity, and Funtime Freddy. Meaning question. that the Funtimes and Circus Baby were probably built pretty early in the timeline, and honestly, it does make sense. William had to get the board of whatever company he was doing stuff for to sign off on the designs he made, something that probably would have been much more difficult after the MCI if he would have been associated with the murders. Additionally, three of the Funtime animatronics, Freddy, Foxy, and Bon Bon, are clearly associated with Fazbear Entertainment characters. And by the time FNAF 2 rolls around, William doesn't seem to be associated with Fazbear Entertainment, which owned these characters, or at least in the position where he would be making animatronics. Yeah, the the whole, like, is William ousted from the company is tough. Um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and, and again, like, as I was working on the timeline stuff, that's, that's tricky, because he's ousted from the company, and yet Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals is still under the umbrella that is Fazbear's. So, for Faz, like, at least according to the encyclopedias and some of the ancillary content outside of this that's trying to, like, help you piece together the lore, right? They say, like, oh, you know, Circus Babies and that whole brand, Entertainment Rentals, Circus Babies Pizza World, all of that is still under the Fazbear umbrella. I don't know. It, and it's hard for me to say, like, well, no, it's not. I think from a cleaner narrative standpoint... It's confusing, it, like it being more closely associated with Afton, robotics is interesting, I don't know. It is it is one of those tricky ones, and especially if Circus Baby's Pizza World and Entertainment and Rentals launches after the closure of Fazbear's. Again, you get into these weird territories where like, things just have a lot of friction pushing up against each other, and it doesn't work quite as clean as you want it to. Unless he got permission from the board of a new company to infringe on Fazbear Entertainment's property somehow, he would have had to make the fun times while still associated with the company. And probably previous to the MCI, seeing as the board wasn't quite suspicious enough to not sign off on the murder robots. However, he would need a reason to make said murder robots so early in the timeline. Right. Unfortunately, or unfortunately for Elizabeth, I think he had one. It seems likely that the fun times were made to lure children so that William could study Remnant, a special substance right. created by the combining of souls or memories with metal due to powerful emotions, what such as those about? created by the death of a child. This means that for William to make the fun times for that purpose, at least one child would have needed to possess something, and we have the perfect candidate, Charlie Emily. She was the first kid William killed, probably as sure. a way to lash okay. out at Henry if his whole flip-flopping between jealousy and near worship thing from the Silver Eyes carries over to the games, and she's ah. the first kid we see possess an animatronic. Yes. When Charlie possessed the puppet, the animatronic gained tear streaks on its face that weren't there before, something William could have seen and investigated, leading to his discovery of Remnant. Heck, the song title of the security puppet minigame in Pizzeria Simulator where we see the circumstances of Charlie's death is called Alchemist fantasy, which most likely refers to how Alchemist had the fantasy of creating an elixir of life that could provide functional immortality. I don't the, the song names are really interesting, and I've never done a full-on deep dive and used it as, like, strong evidence points, but a lot of the t the song names that are used throughout the fa- the fa- 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 yeah, fa- fa- the- you think I'd said it so many times at this point that I'd be able to, like, pronounce it without stumbling across it. The Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, a lot of the song names are really interesting. Um, one that I saw circulating in the aftermath of our uh, final timeline episode was one about, uh, it's it's like a remaster of Ballora's song that was used in an early trailer, I think of Security Breach or whatever, where people are like, wait a minute, you know, if, if this is all about Mrs. Afton's quest to like rebuild her family and if she's in charge here and like this is starting her story arc or her villain era or whatever, there's a connection between like Ballora and her and I, I forget what song it is that that is played during I think it was during the trailer and I'll make sure I research it before our, our FNAF live talk back um but yeah it was one of those things where it's like that's another evidence point I'm like oh that's a really good evidence point and again the songs are just like there's not many of them but they do seem very intentionally titled and designed to like fit into you know just small little evidence clues along the way that help kind of tell the story so Alchemist Fantasy, I, I don't disagree. And again, like I think we're on the same page here. Like I said in my timeline, the fact that William sees animatronics moving, you know, the puppet flying around and Freddy in the FNAF 2 location, the fact that he sees them moving around is the thing that's like, hey, that's weird. Remnant's a thing. I, you know, I want to study this. This is curious to me. So I, I agree with that being the motivation, the impetus for him to want to capture more kids and start to do things. When it happens, is tough, and the fact that this, and we'll, we'll see if she has an answer for this, but my concern is that if it happens off screen, it's kind of a bummer that we don't see that moment of realization. 
then again, this is that franchise where everything happens off screen. So, well, who am I to complain? I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds pretty similar to Remnant keeping spirits anchored to the world of the living. So to me, it makes sense that Charlie possessing the puppet was the start of William's own alchemist's fantasy. Sure. Where he saw that something was keeping her spirit around and wanted to know how he could do the same. <sighs> yeah, I... Yeah, I just wish that there was, like, something there. I agree. I agree. We just... That's a, that's a leap that we would never see, and we never see the two of them really associate or interact with each other. We never hear women talk about it. Like, there's... Yes, 100%. And I, I recognize that a lot of my timeline was a lot of, like, here's a couple evidence points. Let's speculate from there. So I, I absolutely agree with this. I... My, my just one concern... Like, we have a moment where he sees the puppet, and he sees these creatures and so I, it's tough tough and honestly the fun times being built before the mci makes sense for another reason if it was robots making the kids go missing and only after making sure the kid was alone as indicated by circus baby counting children william would have had an alibi and if anyone did see what happened it would be a machine failure not necessarily william's fault of course this had the unintended consequence of causing his daughter's death to which he probably went you know what i'm doing it myself of course there's also the fact that was she she did a good job of answering my concern because and i i got there at the same time where it's like oh then why would he go back to killing him by hand <laughs> when you have such a convenient murder device like why would you go and do it by hand and it's like well yeah if his daughter got killed then he would do it by, by himself i guess yeah i guess charlie could be the first domino to fall that's the fact that in sister location there was a spring lock suit that baby tells mike was from her old pizzeria so for one to be made for that location it makes sense that it would be before their use was discontinued by fazbear entertainment with all that said sister location could still pretty much be anywhere in the timeline in terms of the three options i presented earlier as the rental location could have been opened after any of the three closures based solely on when circus baby's pizza world was open sure. however as we can be pretty sure that william spent at least some time at the rental location based on the secret room that had cameras monitoring the fnaf 4 bedroom and a fredbear plush with the walkie-talkie, the location wouldn't have opened after his death, so we can narrow things down by pinpointing when the Follow Me minigames and William's spring locking took place. Okay, so Charlie dies, possesses Puppet. William sees Puppet, like, hey, Remnant, that's a thing. Let's, let's learn about living metal. Let me build the fun times, capture kids, and test on them. Yeah, and then it's like, whoopsie, my kid died. So that would still allow you to have circus babies under the umbrella of Fazbear. That's fine because William is still good with the company. So that checks that kind of major plot point. Like, so circus babies is still under the umbrella of Fazbear. Hey, we got the circus thing. And then Elizabeth gets scooped. He's sad about it. At which point then he's like, okay, I'm doing it myself. <laughs> We're doing it live! <laughs> Let me grab my knife and my weirdo crank! Let's go! Uh, this is still happening in... So then in 1985 is the missing children's incident. Stabby, stabby, stab, stuffy, stuffy, stuff. <laughs> FNAF 2, more stabby, stabby, stab, stuffy, stuffy, stuff. That's 1987. And then after 1987, everything shuts down. Right? Because then it's like, Whoa, there's so many murders happening in these restaurants! This is a terrible place for kids. Everyone's dying. Huh. And then 1993, like, it opens up, he, like, revisits it, he starts tearing things apart. Afton's on the run at that point, he's in hiding, he's doing it at night. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, it, it definitely checks out. It, like, I think, yes, I, I, I'm, we'll see where she lands up on this, but if, if she's going the direction I think she's going, yeah, 100%. I think this is great. I think this, this is wonderful. Um, it bothers it. Your theory doesn't bother me. What bothers me is I hate the fact that he does remote killing before physical kill. Like, it's just such a weird order of events there. Yes, Ash? No, I'm just looking at you. Oh, okay. You're just looking close again. Okay. That's yeah. <laughs> Every time you get up and do the awkward lean, I'm like, oh, clearly Ash has something to say. No, nope, you just really want to get up close and personal with my image. That's great. Do you have a problem with my stance? No, 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 no problem. No problem. We're good. Just, I just want to make sure that it sounded like when you go up and take your claim your space, it feels like you're like, I have, I have things to say. I have thoughts. No, sometimes I just perceive... Okay, Which well. sounds crazy, because I realize I do talk a lot. No, perceive. Go ahead. Perceive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so anyway, no, I, I, I like this. I think where it's going is great. Like I said, my problem is more with the 
order of events just based on like the time. Hey, here's a bunch of futuristic robots with a remote murder mechanism. So Afton's like, has like the weirdest 40 chess move ever, like galaxy brain move of like, I killed one kid, it got possessed. So I'm going to create a weird system where I grab things using animatronic arms and I stuff them in there and it's going to have super advanced robotic suits but we're still going to have a franchise that has very rudimentary suits. And then eventually I'm going to give that up and stab kids by hand. It's just it's like, it bothers me from like an escalation. It's like escalate to like 11. And then let's just dial it back to like a level of like two, three, like, you know, normal serial killer stuff. That's, I think my biggest problem with it from a narrative standpoint is, is it gives you this weird, like uh, back and forth, like ebb and flow of like escalation of Afton's motives. So, that bothers me, but from a timeline standpoint, from, like, fitting in the evidence that everything, you know, that the series has given us, it's pretty good. The end of night minigames in FNAF 3 show the original animatronics being led through the FNAF 1 pizzeria to yep. the safe room by Shadow Freddy before being torn apart, leaving the souls to chase William into the spring Bonnie suit that caused his death. The pizzeria is run down with a leak in the ceiling and boarded up doors, and seems pretty much abandoned as the only human we see is William. Yep. However, I don't think that means that these minigames are after the FNAF 1 location closed. First of all, somehow William had to get sealed in a safe room, as phone dude in FNAF 3 only found him after being told about safe rooms being boarded up or something. Okay. It seems unlikely to me that something like that could have happened if no one was there to seal William in. Y yes and no. Uh, again, this goes to the idea of you have to question how active the pizzerias are after the building closes itself. I think it like I think that the leaking ceiling, the shut down bathroom, how derelict that building is at that point. I feel like you have to like all the clues are pointing in the direction of like this place is shut down. It is condemned. It is not operational anymore. So, to me, again, like, I think a lot of FNAF theories are very quick to dismiss or throw away. Like, hey, once a, a location is closed, it's done. It's over. There's nothing else to do there. Whereas for me, I think that there is still activity that can happen, right? There can still be skeleton crews, security guards, storage that happens there. You know, we talk, we hear about how different suits are being stored in remote locations for the time being and stuff. I feel like just because the the restaurant is no longer accepting customers and is no longer serving food doesn't necessarily mean that everything else ceases at that point. You can revisit those places, you can store things in those places, you can send them back. Additionally, phone guy seems to have been alive when the room was sealed, as he's the That's one fair. to announce the rooms at various locations being sealed with no one allowed to go in and get their belongings out beforehand. Almost as though there was something to hide in there, like a dead body. Even if the other phone guy recording seemed to be from earlier in the timeline, probably closer to the MCI and beforehand, the fact that the final recording is about rooms being sealed in a game about Springtrap who was sealed in a room, with the recordings being found in the FNAF 1 location along with the Funky Rabbit Man, leads me to believe that these tapes- I just like the idea of William Afton as the Funky Rabbit Man, honestly. Just the idea of Funky Rabbit Man, just like busting out like, Whoa, that bark! Doing his little spring lock dance. That's like, uh, made me think immediately of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Yeah. Was, yeah. This is like Willy Will and the Funky Rabbit. <laughs> Man, you really are Michigan Grandpa, aren't you? <laughs> the Funky Bunch, huh? Yeah, it's an old Marky one. Mark, that's a... You, <laughs> You and your McDreamies and your Marky Mark. Wow, we are just spitting the, the like most relevant of <laughs> cultural references to everyone today. We're a teaching show. We know we, we yeah. very clearly are. What is a record player? Who is Marky Mark and the Funky Fuck? Beatles have songs. Yeah, that's it. I do like the idea though. I I I with I wish that the FNAF movie ends with Matthew Lillard busting out of like a wall or something as Springtrap <laughs> doing just like the funky rabbit dance. Like pull it, you know, Blumhouse probably learned a lot from all the promotion around um, Mithrigan, Megan, uh, where uh, Megan's dance went so viral on TikTok, her doing this like weird little robotic evil dance before she murders everyone. Um, you know, maybe Blumhouse is like, you know what? Let's do that again. <laughs> Like, let's, and so you have, like, Afton in a robot suit doing, like, a little, like, goofy gimmick that everyone on TikTok can then replicate. Are you perceiving or are you talking this oh, time? Oh, I'm speaking. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Um, so you know how when you're about to do this real big event, yeah. you get kind of nervous? Mm -hmm. Um, And I've been told in the past by um, mentors and people I idolize mm -hmm. to get that energy out somehow. Yeah. So maybe 
and hear me out on this. He's doing his murder dance. Yeah, it's dance. it's a mechanism to tame the adrenaline and the nerves before absolutely annihilating a child. <laughs> the funky rabbit man dance. <laughs> exactly. What is what 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 do you envision the funky rabbit man dance to be? Exactly. Like I'm in an animatronic suit right now. I'm going to off some kids. What am I doing before <laughs> before I annihilate them as you so aptly put it? So I think that legs are definitely wider than shoulder length. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right? And I yeah. think it's like a little bit of like a squat and a okay. lean back kind of situation. Ooh, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really intense squat if we're like that deep. But you know. Sure. I, I'm on the couch. But we'll I, assume that my legs are spread. You know what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I cherish this time that we spend together, friends. <laughs> Me too. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Spread. Yep. So spread. And then, you know, it has a similar energy to what Tobey Maguire does. Um... <laughs> You know, that dance is, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think- And um, all the women look at him disgusted. <laughs> William Afton rolling down the street. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some cool foot stuff happening too. Yeah, yeah sure, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of restricted by my location. Oh, uh, sh sure, sure. sure. Um, we can go, we can go wide, point the camera down at the feet. We could, but we could. But, but do we? But then I'm back on wiki feed all over again. So um, you know. you're wearing you're wearing socks, yeah, right? You, know, you can you can infer a lot from the socks. Just saying. I like I like this funky rabbit dance. This is a win. So basically, what we need y'all to do is to take a cutout of either Matthew Lillard with golden bunny ears, or just the golden Freddy, or sorry, the golden Bonnie head. Stick it onto Tobey Maguire from Spider Man Three. And you know, just let it follow the motion track, and we'll and that's it. That's the funky rabbit dance. Yep. And, and then we'll if you send that to Blumhouse. It. Yes. And we'll be like, hey, <laughs> here's your marketing strategy. You're welcome. Yeah. At which point, then everyone's like, oh my gosh, Matthew, that was so smart. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> Didn't solve the FNAF timeline, but you did give us a, a banger marketing strategy. Yeah, and we know that Matthew Lillard's going to put his own little twist on it. Oh, certainly. So that's going to be a joy and a thrill to see. I love the moment in the FNAF movie when Matthew, uh, sorry, when William Afton goes, zoinks! <laughs> <laughs> and he zoinks all over the place. <laughs> and then the, yeah, he zoinks everywhere. And he eats a comically large sandwich. <laughs> his mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> He like has he gives Mangle a Scooby snack, <laughs> Mangle snack. Roar! Roar! I was the first. I've seen everything. Okay, Scoob. Points. <laughs> wow! Whoa, guys! Let's kill some kids. Oh man, that movie's gonna be a trip. It is. It is. I can't wait for when he talks to Henry and he starts every sentence with "like man." Oh, <laughs> like man! Whoa! Whoa, guys! All right, let's keep going. Let's finish this off. We're close. Tapes are a bit more spread out than they may seem at first glance, or at least that one of them was recorded in the location where they were found. But that's not even the strongest evidence for William dying before FNAF 1. That honor goes to the animatronics themselves. It's easy to assume that since this is a FNAF 1 map, these would be the FNAF 1 animatronics, and technically they are. However, there's something that these animatronics have, or more specifically, Freddy and Bonnie, that their FNAF 1 designs don't. Buttons. But you know what animatronics- Oh, buttons! He's counting the buttons! Do you have buttons? The withered animatronics from FNAF 2, which were then reused at the FNAF 1 location and made into the classics. Funny that their FNAF 1 designs don't. Buttons. Fair. Okay, so these have. But you know what animatronics do have buttons? The withered animatronics from FNAF 2, which were then reused at the FNAF 1 location and made into the classics. Given the casing of Freddy that we see in FNAF 3 doesn't have buttons, I don't think this could be a design change made after the events of FNAF 1. Mm. Instead, I think that rather than completely redesigning the animatronics right off the bat when the FNAF 1 location opened, they simply finished repairing the withers, leaving the buttons as part of their designs. I miss the days of just counting buttons. Instead of like, AND THEN IT BECOMES A ROBOT KID POSSESSED BY THE SPIRIT OF Ch GHOST CHARLIE AND MANIPULATED BY MRS. Ed. It was simpler times back then. How many toes does it have? Three? This has three toes, that has three toes. Nope. Nope. Now it's like, well, but maybe they're speaking to it in code, and then Fazgoo gets into the animatronic. 
Endos. Then when William came in and ripped them apart, mm. the Endos were salvaged and rebuilt, but with new casing. After all, according mm. to the newspaper about the FNAF 2 locations closing, the company was on a significantly lower budget, so they probably couldn't just get new ones, which sure. could also explain the rundown condition of the building. Rather than building a shiny new restaurant, they had to reuse one that had already been made, and as such it would be in rough condition. As for William being the only one there, it's possible that he took up a job as a security guard, meaning he would be the only one in the building as he destroyed the rebuilt withers to get their remnant, or whatever he was doing, and then got springlocked, leaving the day crew to come in, find the dismantled animatronics and the dead guy, and build a fake wall over the original door. And the dead, yeah, no, the dismantled animatronics and the dead guy. You know, fine. Ignore their problems. So given William is pretty dead by the time FNAF 1 rolls around, I think we have to rule out the rental location opening after FNAF 1. Now for the slightly more okay. complicated part. Placing sister location I- <laughs> Slightly more complicated part. As if, if, as if all of this was totally like, yeah, so there's gonna be a test at the end of this. Just so you know, there'll be a pop quiz. So I hope you're studying up. Get ready. Strap in, friends. Either before or after FNAF 2. A lot of the evidence for either side can go both ways, unfortunately. Mike gets fired for odor, could be because the dude's a corpse, or it could be that the animatronics he's tampering with smell bad because they had dead kids in them at one point. John! Yeah, he's inserting himself in everything these days, that guy. He's just everywhere. Mike draws casual bongos and exotic butters in the survival logbook? Well, the office depicted in the logbook is FNAF 3's office, so either the book was made around that time, or the FNAF 3 office was made to imitate the book. Something that could actually be possible, since it does seem like Fazbear Entertainment repossessed Mike's logbook after he used it based on the sticky notes telling the next owner to not mention the spring lock suits to anyone, but who, who knows? Ho yeah, the, the, the sticky note. The logbook, man. After he the logbook is a banger. Telling the next I think the logbook might be the, my, fingle, my single favorite piece of, of FNAF like, stuff to come out. I love the, the logbook. I think it's great. I know last time I said, like, oh, these, these are my single greatest moments in the FNAF franchise, where I'm like, oh, it's the FNAF 6 one and the FNAF 2 minigame of Save Them. The logbook, so good. I, I think to this day, it's so smart. No one suspected it. It was really the first time that the franchise branched out into like telling lore in a very unusual, interesting way like this. And it has very similar uh, vibes to like the Gravity Falls journals, which are awesome. Um, I love that logbook. I wish that the new stuff that they've come out with, the, the coloring book, the recipe book, we'll see the recipe book, but like some of the new stuff that isn't like explicitly like, this is lore. You know, I, I wish that there was stuff hidden in the in the coloring book. I bought it, nothing in it. I wish that there was stuff in the recipe book. I have it on order. I suspect that there's not going to be in a, anything in on it. But um, I loved that book. And it still, to this day, the fact that we still don't know what the Foxy Grid was trying to tell us, if it was used at all. It's probably another one of those, like, let's see that out there. Ah, yes, maybe not. Maybe, maybe at this point, like, let's see, if I have Scott, one question for Scott. Maybe... Maybe I meet him at some point. What do I ask him? I'll ask him about the foxy grid. Hey, do you know how to solve that thing? He'll be like, what? There's a foxy grid? What? Maybe he, does, maybe he has no idea. Maybe that's what it is. I think you should ask him what his favorite color is. Oh, obviously it's purple. Are you sure? Not <laughs> Just end of discussion. <laughs> I was not letting you get away with that that quickly. Purple. Yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. Purple. It leaned like magenta-y before. I mean... Oh, Maybe wait. it changed with the times. Oh, you're talking about like like the color of the characters and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask him what his specific hex code. Oh, what, perfect. What is the hex code of your favorite color? <laughs> perfect. Thank there you. It is. I'll, just so we're precise about it. Thank you. Because it might not be purple. Maybe it's like royal purple. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm mention the spring lock suits to anyone, but who knows. However, there is a way that we can be pretty sure of when sister location takes place. Despite what a lot of people say, I do think Scott is telling a cohesive story with this series. His author blurb in the books says he is first and foremost a storyteller at heart, and in his Reddit post about the one retcon he made, he said that while the story has developed new originally unintended details, the pieces we are given do fit together. And that brings us to the final evidence. Narrative consistent- Being a storyteller though, you can make stories about yourself too. No offense to Scott. No, but like, it's it's true. Like, you can, you can cobble it together. See and character motivation, specifically that of Michael and William Afton. By completing the hardest game mode of Sister Location's custom night, we get a speech from Michael to his father, where he more or less summarizes what happened during Sister Location. Yeah. What matters here is the end of his speech, where he says, There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. 
No matter when in the timeline you put him actually saying this speech, I think this gives us Michael's motivation throughout the games. William is present in the FNAF 2 location only for Michael to show up there days later under the name Fritz Smith. William then goes to the FNAF 1 location and by the time Mike gets there as Mike Schmidt, William is sealed up in the safe room. In FNAF 3, he finds his father and tries to destroy him only for William to escape. Finally, in Pizzeria Simulator, he reunites with his father again before the place is burned to the ground. Pretty much every game has Michael trying to find his father. It is interesting that, so, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if that's true. It, I mean, we agree, like, I think there is general agreement at this point that, like, Michael is chasing after William, and at, through multiple locations. Like, I, I think it's, no matter what you say about the, like, actual, like, order of events and timeline, it feels like everyone pretty much agrees at this point that, like, Michael has been to all the other locations, that Michael is the guy who is visiting all these other ones, because otherwise, why is the FNAF 3 security guard having all these visions of, of past animatronics? That doesn't make sense. Um, so the difference, though, is whereas my timeline proposed all of Afton stuff happens, and then Michael kind of, like, retraces his steps, this is much more they're in lockstep with each other, and so William goes, and Michael is closely following him. It's interesting. It's a, it's a minor difference, but it, it, it tightens things up on the timeline standpoint, which I appreciate. Otherwise, you're just dealing with a lot of time. That It does create a large gap in time between 93 and 2023 for Fazbear Frights, where not a whole lot happens. And so I think like that was one of the reasons also why I'm like, oh, well, he's going back and doing all of this stuff. And it would be weird for him to like be going around and burning locations and attacking, you know, after Afton, immediately after Afton leaves those locations. It, it tightens it up to a level that I'm like, I don't know if I would necessarily agree that with that, especially when you have this 20 year gap afterward. Um, but if all of us, yeah, it's it's interesting. I like I like the, I like the concept of it. I'd never considered it to be so tightly together, because again, it because everything's now layered on top of each other. It complicate. Go figure. It's FNAF. It, it complicates things a little bit. It's not as like clean from a narrative like this, then this, then this, then this. But it's like this and this this and this like you always have this kind of like overlapping series of events that are kind of like running in parallel to each other it's possible for sure it's interesting i like it and that's a motivation that would have been given to him after essentially becoming a zombie and losing his shot at a normal life. Not only would Sister Location being prior to FNAF 2 work well for Michael's story arc, but it works really well for Williams as well. If the reason he dismantled the pre-FNAF 1 animatronics was to collect their remnant, his activity during FNAF 2 was likely for a similar reason. And if he was collecting remnant, he would need- I, I did, as we were listening to this, I did, I never thought about that, but I, I do recognize that that's a cool detail, where why would Afton have a crank, or why would Afton have- like, the thing that he's holding, which I originally said in my, like, second FNAF theory was a phone, right? Which, you know, at the, at the time, that was, like, the best thing we had. But why else would he have a crank wrench, whatever? Again, this whole time I've been assuming, oh, it's a crank for the spring lock suits because that's what they were always kind of like, you know, oh, we got to crank them open so you can fit into it. And so I'm like, oh, it's, it's the spring lock suit crank. But the idea that he's coming here to dismantle things or, or take them apart again, just like he's doing in FNAF 3, that's interesting. And I like that as a call out. It's good. Need a good reason to do that. For example, his murder robots that were being rented out and possibly gathering remnant, ditching circus babies and getting all the remnant into the scooper injected into Michael. Even if Michael was instructed to go to circus babies by William, that doesn't mean William had to be dead to not be around for Michael to have That's the fair. goal to find him. I mean, for all we know, he sent Mike there, and when Mike came back filled with robot bits, William noped on out of there so he didn't have to deal with that and could focus on making up his losses. Or Again, I, I talked briefly last time about my, my internal biases. I think one of my internal biases with this franchise at this point is trying to get characters off the table. So that way it simplifies the storytelling and like just tells cleaner, more concise narratives. But what John uh, FNAF has done with his theories and what uh, id's fantasy, ID's fantasy here has gotten me to do is question, you know, maybe I'm too quick to push people off the table or, or like, you know, set them aside so that way another line or another character can take their part of the story. Um, that is, I, I think, you know, I'm recognizing that that's probably a, a storytelling bias of myself, uh, you know, where it's like, oh yeah, well, they're off the table, you know, oh, of course Charlie's not in security breach because she was, you know, she was purged away. It's like, well, but if you actually look, she probably is there in some capacity. I'm like, oh, I, I get it. I just don't want to admit it. And I think what all of these 
you know, this new ilk of FNAF theorists have been doing for me is like getting me to kind of question some of those biases and get me to open up my mind and like say, hey, you know, am I quick to kind of like write some of these characters off? I mean, I think we're all desperate to write these characters. Like everyone's like, don't bring back William, just write him off already. But I think we've all been quick to kind of do that at this point. So it's it's interesting to see the franchise us be like, oh, they're still around. You're, you're not done with them yet. Could have skipped town and come back later under a fake identity like he does as Dave Miller in The Silver Eyes. Any other small details that may not line up probably do have an explanation if looked at from another angle. For example, Mike managing to get hired despite being dead could either be due to Remnant healing his body yeah. or him using an illusion disc to look normal. Sure. After all, the scrapped Fazbear Fright story, You're the Band, includes Mike the security guard who knows a suspicious amount about Freddy's and possession who looks like a normal college kid in the year 2015. So yeah, that story definitely, like, goes a long way to basically explicitly confirm or reinforce. Again, like, some of the Fazbear Fright, there's a lot of, like, fluff in the Fazbear Fright stories, but that one, there's a couple that, like, outright confirm, like, it's, it's Mike in, like, uh, which one is it? It's not coming home. Uh, uh, I forget what it is, but there's the one that actually takes place in Fazbear Frights, and it's literally the story of FNAF 3. And it's like, and the security guard has flashbacks to his abusive dad and blah, blah, blah. And so it's like, oh, yeah, that, that's pretty much confirming that Mike is the guy there. Same thing with You're the Band, right, where you have Mike or a guy that's like, you know, basically the book stand in going around to all the different pizza places and just busts in out of nowhere. And it's like, I'm going to help you, kid. You're possessed. I'm going to help you get rid of this like Fazbear merch. And he does it. And it's like. Well, that was a thing. You know, some are much more explicit about the lore than others. Uh, GGY is kind of the current one that, everyone, that I talked about in the timeline and is kind of like the one that's gotten people mad where it's like, and here's this kid named Gregory who's top of all the arcade cabinets. Like, he's got the top score. Also, he's possessed by Glitchtrap and working for the enemy. Granted, in my timeline, I kind of like skewed that into like, he's a robot kid because I still think that there is very strong evidence to suggest that he is a, the robot kid or that like someone is a robot in that franchise and he's the best fit for it. But... You know, so, but I say, like, oh, but he's working for the villain. So there's a little bit of a skewed perception there. Like, oh, it's this, but not quite. Um, but yeah, it seems like there are a couple stories in the books that are like, and here's the lore. You know, I'm going to tell it to you in a thinly veiled way. So I think some shenanigans could easily be afoot. Mike being a kid in 1983 and presumably an adult and sister location can also be explained since based on how much taller Mike is than the crying child during FNAF 4, he was probably in his mid-teens, meaning sure. he could have pretty easily been 18 by the time sister location happened. Alternatively, Fazbear Entertainment is not known for Maybe. caring about legality in regards to its yeah, employees, and William could have pulled some strings before getting out of there. Either way, I think it makes the most logical and narrative sense for sister location to take place sometime between the missing children's incident and FNAF 2. But hey, if you think there's additional Okay, and FNAF 2. Okay. Evidence for something that you want me to address, feel free to let me know, as I will be reading all of the comments. If you liked the video, I would really appreciate if you shared it with a friend. And MatPad, if you are seeing this and happen to have an open slot for your Timeline Theory talkback stream on the 25th, and are open to having virtual guests, I am in fact available. Half jokes aside, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Don't get stabbed, and have a nice I day. That. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said this at the end of the last episode. Uh, yes, you are already on my invitee list. 100% uh, yes um i like i said i i i don't know i don't know how to pronounce your channel name apparently it's fantasy or id's fantasy sure but uh but no you were already on my to-do list uh as far as people to reach out to so great i'm i'm glad that you're eager hopefully we'll find a time that now works for you that's that's awesome wait we do that lightly. I like this. For some reason, this method of asking me makes me less self-conscious. I agree. A general call out in a video, absolutely so much easier to do than like a targeted email because targeted email feels like personal. It also feels more like specific and, you know, like, like it could be seen as intrusive or whatever. So like, hey, I mean, it's the same thing that I'm doing with like hot ones, right? Where I'm like, hey, Sean Evans, let's get together and need some spice and wings together. You know, and if they ignore you, fine, whatever. It's, you know, if you harass Jeopardy and they're like, ah, screw you, Matt Pat. I'm like, okay, it's, you know, trying to bring your franchise to the next iteration, whatever. Uh, <laughs> whatever, it's fine, don't worry. Um, but no, yes, 100%. Uh, we will be in touch, if not already in touch by the time that this video comes out. Um, final thoughts? Great. 100%. Clap. Actually, no, why am I clapping? Clap in half. It was great. I, I, I think this is really good. I think it solves... I, I have to go back through everything in my mind, but from like a... The big friction points that I have with the timeline that I presented 
as well as kind of the big, like, again, like the tiers of evidence and the tiers of clues that you have to kind of account for. When it comes to the t tiers of clues that to account for with this one, this addresses at least all the stuff on that top tier, like the most important tier that I feel like you kind of need to address. There might be some wonkiness down towards the like lower two tiers. I'm like, oh, but what about this? What about this? But for the most part, I like it. And, and, and I'll tell you what specifically, like I, I need to think more about like, oh, it fits between, you know, before it's before the FNAF 2 location. Maybe I have to think through that one. But I appreciate her call out of the fact that the, the, the claws exist and then he goes back to murder things. Like that's the moment that sticks with me as like, oh, that makes sense why he would do that. And oh, he would learn that. Because again, my motiv the motivation of William building those animatronics so early in the timeline is the thing I could never wrap my head around. And the idea of him encountering the puppet early, we don't see it, which drives me nuts. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not like a, a big thing. You know, his relationship with the puppet is never really clearly defined or anything. But the fact that he meets the puppet and then all of a sudden, you know, rolls into like, hey, I want to experiment with Remnant and stuff. Yeah, I can give you that one. I still, I, I do wish that like, Elizabeth got captured first because that feels like such a more personal moment of like, oh, spirits can possess things. And so like now I'm really incentivized to look into this and I really am curious about it. But I see why Charlie dying, possession of puppet and him being like, oh, there's something here. I see that. That's fair. And I think it solves a lot of the questions that have been leveled against my timeline as well as some of the frustrations that I was having in trying to fit those things together. I still, it bothers me about the escalation thing that I talked about, but from a, like, removing my own personal narrative biases from this, it answers a lot of the evidence that I was having a hard time fitting, so. Good one. Tip of the hat. Good. Awesome. I, all right. Call in the editors. We're doing another 50-minute redacted FNAF theory, part five. The timeline revisited. Redo the thumbnail. The end? Question mark. I just heard Tom shudder all the way from the UK. Oh, 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 it's not Tom who needs to be shuddering. It's definitely the, the editing dungeon. <laughs> those, those guys. Another half hour video. No. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I think, I think maybe, maybe we'll see how this FNAF talk back goes and we'll see if I'm like, yeah, let's do one more of these. Oh, uh, see if I have it in me. Oh. So anyway, this is great. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. Thank you for the call out. Thank you for being so careful to consider all this stuff. I, I, I'm really impressed with the stuff that you've been delivering. It's really good. So I'm excited to talk to you in person as both a human being and also as part of content. So looking forward to that one, you know, human being and content. So uh, at some point that's going to happen, I believe right now, the tentative date for the FNAF talk about is April 7th. Yes. Yes. So I believe the talk back is April 7th. We have a couple last things to confirm for that one, but hopefully that is a thing. Hopefully this video goes up before that. Otherwise, yeah, you saw it. It was great. It's amazing. Uh, and as always, my friends, keep sending me your FNAF theories. Keep engaging with the franchise. It's fun. It's, it's fun to solve mysteries. I grew up watching Law and Order, and so this is just like my version of Law and Order, I guess. <laughs> so thank you. I'll see it. It's, it's my version of Grey's Anatomy. So exactly. This, yeah. So. <laughs> season 15 uh anyway thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video as always remember it wasn't a live stream but it was a video a video for you see ya